this lecture uh, we will see how the finite element formulation will be done for truss structure or the truss element in a truss structure uh, before going to the topic so why do we want to analysis do the analysis for a truss so that's the main motive we know we need to know the motive behind studying all these finite element formulation for trusses or whatever design criteria which we are going to do so what is the motive behind that so let's see when you become a design engineer after your fourth year when you graduate from here so you need to design a structure or a truss structure in particular so if someone asks you to design a truss structure you need to first know the stresses that are being developed in the structure so that you can identify the amount of material that need to be used and what type of material should be used whether we need to use steel or aluminum what is the kind of material that is suitable for the structure mm, these things uh, after doing the structural analysis like after knowing the, what are the forces that are being applied on the uh, truss you need to know the stresses that are being developed so to evaluate those stresses or the strains that are being developed in the structure you need to do some uh, analysis on that after obtaining the forces after obtaining the preliminary forces that are being applied on the structure you need to know what are the stresses that are being developed so for that we can use this finite element formulation for obtaining those stresses being developed so the part which i am going to cover after the end of the course you will know how the how to evaluate the stresses how the after applying the loads what are maybe the loads applying on the structure what displacements might occur uh these things will be the final output which we are going to get after this finite element formulations now going through the topics these are the topics i am going to cover in this lecture uh, starting with the structural stiffness method where how the structural stiffness of individual elements will be evaluated uh, and what is the physical meaning and what are the properties of uh, the stiffness matrix these things we need to cover in the first part later the how the elemental stiffness matrix will be formed which will be more or less similar to the structural stiffness method which i will be discussing so later how the assembly of individual elemental stiffness matrix can be obtained these are the three topics which i am going to cover uh, let's see how much uh, time it takes based on that uh, we might cover in this lecture itself or uh, some part we might be delivering in the next lecture so starting with the introduction so what do you mean by truss so how it is different from the other structures so in this image you can see like uh, some discrete elements were there which are being uh, which can be connected using some nuts or bolts or in some cases some weldings uh, welding joint will be used for connecting these elements so truss is a discrete element structure unlike uh, many other uh, continuous structures so this is how a truss looks and these trusses can take only the axial loading so whatever uh, in whatever direction maybe the load gets applied so the loads will be resolved along the ax along the member uh, for doing the stress analysis or the evaluating the stresses or the strains as i mentioned previously so this uh, loading will result in the axial displacement of individual members so you might have heard of this term degrees of freedom uh, in some other uh, courses also or in the finite element course itself so what do you mean by the degrees of freedom so if someone asks you about uh, uh, any question about the degrees of freedom of any structure mm, we need to know how many quantities individual independent quantities required to define the deformed configuration that is what uh, that is how many quantities is the thing which we will call it as uh, degrees of freedom for example if we consider the plane truss element so this is the plane truss element and snt represents the local coordinate system and d1 d2 are the forces you can consider it as the forces which are being applied along the element so as i mentioned it will take the axial uh, loading the truss element so if these are the axial loads which are being applied so how much distance 
individual point if you consider the point in this end how much distance this has moved after applying these loads uh, is the value which we will consider as the degrees of freedom so the distance is the degrees of freedom in local coordinate system of a truss segment so if you consider the global coordinates you might have uh, seen to this part the local and global part in the previous lectures delivered by vinyas sir so if you consider the global coordinate system these are the general x and y coordinate system which we all know so these are the x and y coordinate system so in this case if it's get displaced if this points get displaced we need to define both and x y coordinates for that point to define how much it has moved to know how much the point has moved in the truss segment so but in general if someone asks you about the degrees of freedom of any structure uh, mostly we will be considering the global coordinates because the local coordinate system might be different for different individuals so to get an unique value generally uh, we will be considering the global coordinate system in almost all the cases so whenever someone asks you about the uh, degrees of freedom of a plane truss element single element it will be the two degrees of freedom which are needed to define the deformed configuration or the deformed uh, structural value at point where uh, the x and y coordinates are required so this is how the degrees of freedom is defined so for example if you consider the five element structure plane and truss structure so we'll be having 5 into 2 each element will be having two degrees of freedom and it will result in 10 degrees of freedom for the structure we will use the global coordinate system for identifying the degrees of freedom so we know now we know for a truss element the degrees of freedom is 2 it is displacement along x axis it is displacement along y axis those will be represented as u and v in this whole chapter which i am going to cover remember the u as the displacement along x direction and y v as the displacement along the y direction and one thing if you can see the subscripts uh, We have written it as one, and here we have written it as two. So the nodes, these are these represents the the subscripts represents the node numbers in finite element formulations. So this is the node one, and so the displacements are represented as u one v one. This is the node two, so the displacements are represented as u two and v two. So this is the convention which we are going to follow in the formulation in the coming slides. So now coming to the assumptions. so for developing any method uh, engineering we will go through some of the assumptions which are need to be considered for developing the formulation which makes our job easy so in this structural stiffness method these are the three assumptions which are going to follow the first one is uh, the member should be uniform uniform i mean it should be having uniform cross section area across uh, uh, the length the material should be a linearly elastic material so stress should be directly proportional to strain when i when i mean by uh, linearly elastic and the pin connected joint should be considered as the nodes if you consider this truss structure these will be the pin joints the numbers which have denoted as 1 2 3 will be the pin joints and these will be the nodes in a finite element formulation of a plane truss structure so we cannot consider the nodes in between the element while formulating the fine element formulation for it structure so we consider the joints the pin joints as the nodes for any truss to the truss element uh, the deformations that will be occurring because of the force that are being applied on the structure will be very small small i mean uh, when compared to the length of the element length of the individual element of the truss structure the deformations for it will be small so these are the three main assumptions uh, sorry i forgot to put second assumption so the other thing is which i have mentioned previously that it can take only the axial loads the truss elements can take only the axial loads these are the three main assumptions which we are going to abide by while developing the structural stiffness method while going through the method so in this uh, case you can see there are circled uh, numbers of 1 2 3 and there are general 1 2 3 um, num numbers so you might get confused uh, let me go through 
the details of this picture uh, this example which i am going to consider so this will be the example which you will see a lot of times uh, in the coming slides also so i think it's better if you can take a note of this structure so you will understand the formulation better uh while you are taking note down of it uh, i will go through the details of the structure so what is meant by the numbers and what is all these things which are denoted here so the node numbers are the numbers which are given here without any circles this is the node 1 this will be the node 2 and this will be the node 3 so based on this node numbers the displacements will be defined like so. as i mentioned previously the circuit will be given the node number in along the x the displacement will be u and along y the displacement will be v so these are the node numbers and these circle numbers represent the element numbers this will be the element 1 this will be element 2 and this will be element 3 and this is the 90 degrees angle here so you are having a roller support and simply support condition here and the angle we can know from this represents the angle if this is theta then tan theta will be 4 by 3 from that you can identify the angle that the member 2 is making with respect to member 3. So these are the details which I mentioned here. So I hope you might have taken down the example. So, so now coming to the method. So first of all before going to the method, I have defined two support conditions. One is a roller support condition, the other is the simply supported boundary condition. So these boundary conditions should be removed before starting this will be the first step for this method where we will remove the support conditions you will get to know like why we are uh, doing this exercise we will get to know in further slides so for that this will be the first step which we need to do that the support condition should be removed so in that case when the support conditions are removed this will be the structure this will be the triangular uh, three element uh, truss element structure which we will be having once we remove the boundary condition so the second step will be we need to lock all the degrees of freedom uh, i mean by locking is as we remove the supports we need to constrain all the degrees of freedom now uh, all the degrees of freedom means the degrees of freedom i have explained what do you mean by degrees of freedom so the displacements along x and y coordinates of each individual nodes should be restricted so initially now all the displacements are restricted so this will be a simply supported, this will be simply supported, this will be simply supported. So this is how we lock all the degrees of freedom. So now coming to activating the u and degrees of freedom. So this will be the u and direction, right? For this will be the node number one. So this will be the u and degrees of freedom. So if we have to activate this, instead of a simply support here, we need to define it as a roller node. So that it can move in this u1 direction which we are defined here so once it is moved you can visualize it like it is being simply supported here simply supported here once we move this this element will get uh, you might be seeing a large uh, large variation in the length but as i mentioned previously you know the assumption right the displacements will be very small in this method so for getting a better visualization I have given it as a large value but the displacements will be very small so this is the deformed configuration of the member 2 and this will be the deformed configuration of member 3 so by a displacement of u1 of member 3 there will be an increase in length for member 2 so we need to find how much distance the member 2 has uh, increased or how much length it has increased so you know this angle is theta you can identify that this value will be u1 cos theta so this deformation of u1 will result in the forces in members 2 and 3 so why not in member 1 as we are applying the load at the node 1 so there is nothing going to happen in the member 1 because the load is being applied only at the junction of these two node, these two elements at this node the other thing which you need to remember is when the load is uh, applied load or uh, applied displacement is perpendicular to any member there won't be any force generated in that member so 
that okay that we will get to know in my further activate no other degrees of freedom you will understand that but uh, i am explaining you this if in this case as we apply the displacement u a this member is not uh, a perpendicular member to the displacement this is an inclined member so the force will be generated in this this is not a perpendicular member to the applied displacement so the force will be generated in this these two members are connected to this node where we are applying the displacement but this is an alien member to this node so no force will be developed in this member so so we have seen the displacement is being applied at uh, node 1 uh, in the example which we have considered because of that we have seen the forces are being developed in member 2 and member 3 so initially let us find out the force being developed in member 2 because of the displacement u1 we have seen the change in the length uh, because of uh, the displacement u1 is u1 cos theta and from the previous example we have seen the tan theta will be 4 by 3 using this uh, we can obtain the cos theta value as 0.6 so the total change in length of the member will be 0.6 u1 now to evaluate the force being generated in the member 2 let's recall the definition of the stiffness what do you mean by stiffness stiffness is defined as force generated in the member for unit deformation in the member so we can write it as let's say k2 is the stiffness of member 2 k2 will be equal to force generated let's call it as f2 f2 by change in length of member 2 so the member 2 length has increased to 0.6 u1 so this implies uh, we can obtain the force in member 2 as k2 times 0.6 u1 so that is the force that will be acted on member 2 this is a tensile force because uh, the change in length is a positive value the length hasn't decreased it got increased so this will result in positive force uh, which we will call it as the tension as the force is a positive force we will call the force as a tension force tensile force will be acted along the number two we have discussed previously about the local coordinate system and global coordinate system so as we are interested in obtaining the stiffness matrix in global coordinate system we have to resolve the forces in local from local to global so if we resolve this force we will get using the theta value which we have defined previously using the theta value we will get the force in x direction as 0.36 k to u1 and y direction as 0.48 k to u1 so for the member to be in equilibrium at both the nodes the, no, the forces should be opposite to each other that is the reason we can see the force is acting in this direction and the force is acting in the other direction so that's the reason why forces are being acted in the opposite directions so now coming to member 3 we have seen how the force is evaluated in member 2 now let us see how the forces what are the forces that will be generated in member 3 so member 3 is also getting increased the length of the member 3 is also getting increased so this will result in a force k3 times u1 because u1 is the displacement of the member 3 if you can remember let me go through the previous slide so member 3 will be increased to a distance of u1 so displacement of member 3 will be u1 so using the same stiffness uh, definition we can write the force being generated in member 3 as k3 times u1 so only these two members will be having the forces so this is the final structure how the loading will be seen in a three element truss so it will be in equilibrium this is after activating u1 degrees of freedom so let us see what happens once we lock all the degrees of freedom and activate the other degrees of freedom which is v1 to see how the activation of v1 so freedom will result in the forces and in which members we will be having the forces is it the same 2 and 3 as as i have mentioned that this node is uh, related to only 2 and 3 whether in the v1 case also we will have the forces in both the members or in only mem one member if it's the case then why only one member 
we will look into it now when uh, v1 degrees of freedom is activated you can see it is inclined to the member 2 and it is perpendicular to member 3 so if you resolve the v1 along member 2 we will get the displacement as v1 sin theta so the member will be displaced to a quantity v1 sin theta but when we resolve the component v1 along number 3 it will be v1 cos 90 which is equal to a 0 so the member 3 won't be displaced because of this v1 degrees of freedom activation so the only member which will be displaced because of the v1 degrees of freedom is the member 2 so because of this reason the force will be developed only in member 2 but not in member 3 if we go to the previous case where you, in u1 to member 3 it is parallel and to member 2 it is an inclined displacement so because of that reason these two members are getting displaced but in case of v1 if we see that's not the case so remember this whenever the displacement activation is perpendicular to any member there won't be any force generated in that member so let us see what will be the force that will be developed in member 2 because of this v1 activation so similar to the previous case the member length will be changed uh, which one which is uh, v1 sin theta sin theta will be 0.8 so the total change in length of member 2 is 0.8 v1 again if we recall the stiffness definition uh, stiffness of the member should be equal to the force generated per unit deformation so k2 will be f2 by 0.8 v1 which implies the force generated in member 2 will be k2 times 0.8 v1 so in the previous case it is uh, an increase in the length of the member 2 while activating u1 but here the member length is being decreased this is the initial length and this is the final length so as is as there is a decrement in the length of member 2 I will experience compression force I am showing in positive direction but you can see the sign of the force which I have denoted here so this will be an axial compression to the member so similarly we have to resolve in global direction so we will be resolving the forces along x and y directions so this will be the equilibrium body of member 2 so this will be the final three element truss free body diagram once we displace mem in the direction of v1 or the v1 degrees of freedom so total as we are having three elements in the truss we will be having six degrees of freedom we have completed looking into the forces generated when we displace two degrees of freedom that is at node 1 u1 and v1 now let's see what will be the forces that will be generated when we displace in the direction of u2 v2 and then u3 and v3 then we can form the final structural stiffness matrix so for u2 u2 will be in this direction so once we displace in this direction there will be shortening of the member which creates a compression force how much it is displaced it is displaced by a magnitude of u2 u2 so the force will be k3 times u2 k3 times u2 so this is how the structure will be looking after displacing can you if you recall what I, what I have mentioned in the v1 degrees of freedom when the member is perpendicular to the displacement no force will be generated in that member so this is an alien member and this member is perpendicular to the displacement so the only member which has the force in it will be the member through now by activating v2 so v2 is in, di in this direction so even that will also result in the shortening of member 1 because of that we will experience a compression force which is k1 times v2 similarly in this case member 3 is perpendicular to the displacement v2 so there won't be any force generated in member 3 the only member which experiences the force is 
k1 times v2 and that is number 1 now we have completed the four degrees of freedom now going to the member uh, the node number 3 it which has uh, act deformation of u3 so when it is displaced to a amount of u3 this case will be similar to the v1 case which we have seen so if you do the same things which i have done previously like considering the angle and how much shortening has happened and all we will find these forces uh, i am not elaborating it as i done for the first two cases you can practice it uh, as a homework you can try it and let me know whether you are getting the same values or not so similarly when we activate v3 this case will be similar to activation of u1 uh, i mean similar is the kind of forces you see and uh, the displacement of the members and all it will be similar to u1 so again the member should be in equilibrium you can see the forces will be equal in both net forces will be equal in it will be zero in x and y so now we have found out the forces that will be developed at the nodes because of activating different degrees of freedom and restricting all the other degrees of freedom so what will happen if we release all the degrees of freedom simultaneously like for example say first if we activate u1 then without locking u1 we will activate v1 then without locking u1 and v1 we will activate u2 in this way simultaneously if we activate one by one degrees of freedom this will be the forces like this will be the stiffness matrix that will be generated so how we can represent this is like if you multiply the row of this matrix to this column vector you will get the nodal force that is applied in x direction at node 1 if you multiply this row the second row with the column you will get the force that will be generated in y direction at node 1 similarly for node 2 and node 3 so previously we have done for each individual cases like individually activating each degrees of freedom but if we activate all the degrees of freedom at a time or simultaneously i mean to say in that case this i have represented this is nothing but representation of forces in terms of matrix and a vector these values will be the resultant forces at each of the nodes so in simply we can write k d equal to r k is the stiffness matrix d is degrees of freedom matrix and r is the resultant force matrix so this is how the structural stiffness method will be built will be used to finally building the stiffness matrix of the structure by using uh, by activating each individual degrees of freedom so i'm i'm been talking about the stiffness and i have defined the stiffness as force per unit length so then what's the meaning of this stiffness k i have i have defined what is k2 and k3 like for that particular mem member what is the force generated per unit deformation so what is this column mean what is this column mean what is the meaning of this matrix so that is what i meant by physical meaning so physical meaning of k is uh, the any ith column of the stiffness matrix is defined as the loads that need to be applied at each individual nodes when the ith degree of freedom is assigned as unity so if we consider the first column in the stiffness matrix that represent the loads that will be applied at each node on the structure when the first degree of freedom that is u1 is assigned as 1 to maintain the deformed configuration of the structure let us revisit the stiffness matrix once again so if u1 is 1 then we are telling that these are the forces that will be generated on the deformed configuration right so we'll go through the previous slides where yeah this is the u1 degrees of freedom right 
so consider u1 as 1 so what is the load in x direction you can see 0.36 k2 plus k3 and in y direction it is 0.48 k2 this is in the 1 I mean p1 this is q1 this is in the opposite direction of y like if you take this as x and this as y so it is opposite to y so by considering the sign convention we need to represent it as minus 0.48 k2 u1 so this is p1 this is q1 then p2 p2 is this is all the same if we consider this as x this is opposite to x like this is in the negative x axis direction so we need to consider this as minus k3 u1 similarly for the node nodal forces in at this node also so coming back to the matrix k matrix see k3 plus 0.36 u2 minus 0.48 k2 minus k3 0 so these are the nodal forces when u1 is 1 similarly these are the nodal forces that will be generated when v1 is 1 these are the nodal forces that will be generated when u2 is 1 go to let's go through the u2 also see there are only two forces that will be generated other forces will be zero you can see from this column so the each individual column of the structural stiffness matrix represents the nodal forces that need to be applied on the deformed configuration this is what the physical meaning of the stiffness matrix is the stiffness matrix which you are seeing here so we have formed the stiffness matrix so let us see what are the properties of this stiffness matrix like if I randomly give some matrix and I will ask you whether the matrix is a stiffness matrix or not how can you just by looking at the matrix whether you can say whether it is stiffness matrix or it is not a stiffness matrix how you would be knowing that using these properties you can identify whether the given matrix to you is a structural stiffness matrix of any structure or not so the first property is the stiffness matrix should be a square matrix of size n by n where n represents the degrees of freedom of the structure not individual element remember if we have I have considered example previously right if we have five elements the number of degrees of freedom of the structure will be 5 into 2 that will be 10 so that in that case n will be 10 so the stiffness matrix will be a 10 by 10 matrix so don't confuse it with the uh, element degrees of freedom this is the structural deg structure degrees of freedom and represents the structure degrees of freedom so the second property will be the stiffness matrix is always a symmetric matrix symmetric matrix means k i z value will be equal to k z i value if I if we revisit the matrix again see this is k12 right if this is a k matrix this is k12 element minus 0.48 k2 this is k21 so k12 is equal to k21 k13 equal to k31 similarly about the diagonal you can see the elements will be equal see the corners k16 and k61 so if you recall the maxwell reciprocal theorem what it says is displacement in jth node due to the force on ith node will be equal to displacement in ith node due to force on jth node after this class you can revisit this maxwell reciprocal theorem once again based on this theorem this is the because of the reason why the stiffness matrix is symmetric and one more thing like the stiffness matrix won't be always symmetric it will be symmetric only when the material which we are using for the structure is having a linear relationship between loads and the displacement so p should be directly proportional to delta mm, only in that case we can say the stiffness matrix of that particular structure will be a symmetric matrix so the third property will be the diagonal coefficients of the matrix should be always be non-zero and should always be positive this is uh, one of the main properties like it will be always true 
because if we apply a force along direction 1 the displacement will be along 1 only so that is what it means the diagonal properties 1 1 2 2 3 3 if we apply load along 2 the displacement will be along 2 if it is the force is along positive x the displacement will be along positive x even here you can see at some other places you can see there will be negatives but along the diagonal you can see all the values are positive so the diagonals of the stiffness matrix should be always positive and non zero whenever if you see a zero value or negative value in the diagonal you can say that uh, the matrix is as unstable the structure uh, of which the matrix belongs to that structure is an unstable structure just by looking at the matrix you can tell whether the structure is a stable structure or not or you might have done some calculation mistakes so you can use these properties even in your exams while you are calculating the stiffness matrix you can use these three properties and check whether the calculations which you have done are right or not by looking at the diagonal terms and the symmetry of the matrix square matrix i think you will be getting for sure even if you make some mistakes in the calculations this should be uh, this should be okay but these two things you can check while calculating the stiffness matrix in the exams so we have seen the structural stiffness method and we have seen the properties and what is the physical meaning and all if you remember that uh, we haven't uh, applied any boundary conditions anywhere till now we are saying we are locking the degrees of freedom and we are releasing it and we are finding the stiffness matrix but in the example i have shown that we have a roller and a simply supported boundary condition but we haven't applied the boundary condition set so in the first case why do we need the boundary conditions what's the use of that let's see that so if you find the de determinant value of this matrix it will be evaluated to zero if you find the give some values of k3 and k2 of your own and find the determinant of this matrix you will find it that the determinant of the matrix will be equal to zero if you remember Cramer's rule we can use uh, kd from using kd equal to r expression we can obtain d our final aim is to obtain the displacements right so d is the degrees of freedom so d equal to k inverse r so k inverse we can evaluate only when determinant of k is a non-zero value but in this case if we are not applying any boundary conditions the determinant will be zero and we cannot evaluate k inverse and we cannot obtain the degrees of freedom so we can obtain the degrees of freedom only applying the constraints or the given boundary conditions of the structure so how many constraints are needed whether it's one or two or how many boundary conditions are required for obtaining the solution minimum boundary conditions minimum number of boundary conditions required for obtaining a proper solution in case of plane truss element truss structure we will be having rigid body motions like whatever may be the structure if you are not having any boundary conditions to it if you place it uh, if you take a ball place it on a table and if you are not uh, placing your hand on it or something so it will be freely moving because of forget about friction if you have friction it will stay there so forget about friction if it is the friction free surface and if you are placing a ball on it it will roll right it will roll to one of the other directions so we will be having that rigid body motions if you are not having any boundary conditions so the number of independent degrees of freedom that will be possible for a plane truss will be translation in x direction translation in y direction and the rotation about z axis there will be some other rigid body motions also it can move in some other directions also uh, it can be in uh, some diagonal directional so it can move but those will not be a independent motion the only independent motions are 
along x along y and rotation along z axis so other rigid body motions will be a combination of these one of the one of these two or uh, these three combinations of these three motions so we need to have minimum three constraints on the plane truss element that is the reason why i have given one simply supported boundary condition and one roller now we are constrained three degrees of freedom that is u2 v2 and u3 if i am not wrong these are the three boundary conditions which are getting constrained in our example problem so that is the reason why i have taken three constraints so whatever may be the structure how many elements it may have the plane truss structure we will we need to have minimum three constraints whether it's an 100 element structure it's not a matter it is independent of number of elements whenever you see a plane truss structure you can see the number of constraints should be three otherwise it is an unstable structure just by looking at the diagram you can say whether it's a stable structure or no, not a stable structure i mean unstable structure so this is about the constraints and uh, the stiffness method so let's find out how by using the constraints how we are going to obtain the displacements for the example now we now we have the stiffness matrix now we know the constraints so let's see how we are going to find out the reactions that in, that are being developed at the supports and what are the displacements that will be developed in the structure using this formulation we are going to find out the reaction forces and the displacements so if you see the vector here du represents the unknown degrees of freedom and dk represents the known degrees of freedom and rk represents the known resultant loads and ru represents the unknown resultant loads if you observe clearly here uh, on the left hand side i have written du and on the right hand side i have written rk but in general what we think like on the lhs side if you have du on the rhs side we should be having ru right so is it true whether the equation is correct here or i have written something wrong let's find out whether it's uh, the same or it should be a different case here let us take a example so this is the same example and uh, here i'm applying a load in the negative y direction at node 1 right this is the stiffness coefficients uh, you will get to know what these values will be and all so if we consider this example now let us see what are the unknown degrees of freedom the unknown degrees of freedom are we don't know after applying the load what are the displacements in u1 and v1 so u1 and v1 are the unknowns and the other unknown is the v3 we don't we don't know the value of v3 so the unknown degrees of freedom are u1 v1 and v3 let's see what are the corresponding loads do we know the loads in x direction yeah we know there is no load so it is zero in x direction what is the load in y direction as, as it is in negative y axis it is minus p what is the load in v3 degrees of freedom direction there is no load that will be generated it is not constant here we are have a roller support so if you have seen here when we have unknown degrees of freedom we know the loads that are being applied at that degrees of freedom in the direction of those degrees of freedom that's why when we have known degrees of freedom we will have unknown loads and if we have unknown loads we will have known loads unknown degrees of freedom will be having the known loads so we have seen what are the unknown degrees of freedom right now we will see what are the known degrees of freedom u2 and v2 you as it is a simply supported case u2 and v2 are zero right and uh, u3 is also zero so u3 u2 v2 are the known degrees of freedom do we know the forces here those are the reaction forces we don't know the reaction forces and we need to find them so those are the unknown forces so 
this is how the formulation will be made the final matrix will look like using this matrix we will find the unknown degrees of freedom and unknown resultant forces let's expand these equations so we once we expand the equations we will get k11 times du plus k12 times dk equal to rk this will be the one equation and k21 times du plus k22 times dk is ru this will be the second equation so by using equation 1 and by subjecting du we can write du as once you take this term on the right hand side it will be rk minus k12 times dk right so then multiply both sides on left hand side and right hand side with k11 inverse then you will get the expression for du as k11 inverse rk minus k12 dk you this is a known quantity right rk dk is also a known quantity we have already evaluated the stiffness so finally we can evaluate the unknown degrees of freedom so using this unknown degrees of freedom if we substitute back in the equation 2 here then the only unknown will be the forces right this is known and once we evaluate this this is also a known quantity k22 is known k21 is known so we can know the reaction forces also this is how we are going to calculate the unknown displacements and unknown reaction forces using the structural stiffness method and these formulations so we will go through the previous example we have already found out the stiffness matrix and you these are the degrees of freedoms at each node two two degrees of freedoms will be there and uh, here uh, we will be representing the loads in pq p represents the load in x axis and q represents the load in y axis and one two three are the node numbers so this is k d equal to r now we have previously discussed right what are the known quantities and unknown quantities if you remember those p1 q1 and q3 are the known quantities and u2 v2 and u3 are the known quantities so if we see the formulation again we have had du and dk then rk and ru but here we have u1 we have u2 v2 here and u3 here so this is placed at somewhere else and some degrees of freedom are here so we don't have that arrangement like what i've shown shown in the formulation that rk and ru kind of segregation is not here we need to rearrange the rows and columns to obtain the equations as we have seen in equation one and two final expressions so first we will interchange the rows which rows which we are going to interchange see u1 what we should be having first we should be having unknown degrees of freedom right what are the unknown degrees of freedom u1 v1 and v3 then we should be having known degrees of freedom so these two are unknown that is fine then in the third row what we need to have v3 right even in the here also in the loads we need to have q3 p1 q1 q3 u1 v1 v3 so if we first interchange the rows we can interchange the load vector here p1 q1 q3 will be there we will interchange third and sixth rows third and sixth rows will be interchanged if you look here we have 0.48 k2 minus 0.64 k2 here minus k3 0 so once we interchange the rows see we have interchanged the rows not interchanged i mean the last row the last row is kept here so the load corresponds to this q3 is the product of this into all these degrees of freedom right so q3 when we place it here after p1 q1 this row should be going here right so that is what we have done so here we have replaced the last column last row in the third row we have replaced in the third row now after interchanging the rows the load vector has updated now we have uh, r k and this is ru now we should be having 
du and dk now to get the du we need to interchange the columns also the last column should be placed in the third column so this should be placed here and the other columns will move that is how the replacement will be done so third row and third column are interchanged you can start with column and then you can go to the row or you can start with the row then you can go to the column this is how now we have this is unknown degrees of freedom these are known degrees of freedom these are known forces and these are unknown forces or the reaction forces now we have in kind the formulation in kind what i have given in equation 1 and equation 2 so if you recall the expression again here we have written k11 k12 k21 k22 so this part will be k11 and this 3 by 3 ma matrix will be k12 this 3 by 3 part will be k21 and this 3 by 3 part will be k22 so this k12 into du du is u1 v1 v3 this k12 into dk these are the known quantities right u2 v2 and u3 these are the zeros in this example it is zero it may not be zero we will look into that example also when it's not zero how we are going to the find the reactions and displacements in the later stage so using rearrangement of rows and columns we can use this formulation to find the unknown degrees of freedom and the resultant loads so till now we have seen structural stiffness method uh, what we have done is we have uh, activated individual degrees of freedom and we have obtained the stiffness matrix then by using rearrangements we, will, we, will, we are going to find the loads and the unknown degrees of freedom but here we have only three elements right so we are able to do for each element how much displacement is occurring and how much uh, loads will be generated and all so if i give some 200 element structure on each element on each degrees of freedom then if we have 200 elements the degrees of freedom will be 400 we can't do it for 400 times and obtain the stiffness matrix that takes a lot of time right so this whole procedure which we have done till now is to understand the physical meaning what is the physical meaning of the stiffness matrix and this physical meaning you can understand only when you derive the stiffnesses individually and the properties of the stiffness matrix these are the two main things for which we have derived this structural stiffness method we haven't entered into the actual finite element formulation which you see in the textbooks the formulations with c square cs if you have gone through the textbook of trusses you will see c square cs and some matrix will be there which will be repeated to get the whole structural stiffness method or st structural stiffness matrix so in the next class we will we are going to see the elemental stiffness matrix how for individual element we can find the stiffness and by doing some uh, combination of those we can obtain the structural stiffness matrix that i am going to cover in the next class